so I, I think the plan for today um, is um, first talk a little bit more about the these curves on surfaces, which are also called simplicity as examples. So, so logically belongs with next time, but I'm talking then to talk pretty briefly about um, finite group examples. Um, this is sometimes called vector open theories. And then the main thing I want to talk about today is this argument that any time um, you have a say a quantum field theory and it's also a topological that this be sort of the thing is what I've been calling these scheme modules or generalized scheme modules. So up until now we've been doing these curves on surfaces, modular relations, and I haven't really motivated why that has anything to do with T50s or physics. And that's what we're hoping to explain today. And this is kind of in some ways it's kind of the main one of the main ideas. Um, and then, if there's time, we'll start um, trying to make things more formal and axiomatic. So, we'll axioms. So last time we um, we had various examples of functors f from manifolds say dimensional and those two most of the time and um, we looked at this is um, basically examples we looked at in two case. Um, Curves and M, and then we define this vector space A of M to the boundary condition C, and then we define the C linear combinations of um, this thing curves and curves. Modulus some real variation. And part of the, the point of this point of view is that there's, there's lots of different invariants that can be constructed in this different form. We're just going to vary what this f is over the course, and there'll be lots of different examples and we'll vary what this local relation is. But a lot of machinery will be used to analyze these examples and see how the data we're going stays the same. And so the idea is to prove the bloom theorems once and for all. Very um, So that's in general set up. One of the particular things we looked at last time, again, so I'm jumping back and forth between the generalities in this particular example of curves in the two manifold. Um, our relations were isotopy. We're allowed to get rid of trivial loops. This is some number of delta times the empty picture. Not that's number. Um, and these, these are sort of relations we want to. There's, there's a family of examples of relative relations that start out like this, but then the next thing we do um, is different options. So note, note that these two are not to, to show that. Um, scale module of this with any boundary conditions is on um, finite dimension. So that's a desirable property, but we might want to take further questions because if we use any manifold other than this, we're going to infinite dimensional vector spaces. We start out with this. So the, 
before the next generation of proposal is still in prior dimension for any surface. Um, and we spent most of the time yesterday talking about this um, Z2 homology example where we said this and this point to that. And the part of delta equals one. Um, but there's actually an, an infinite family of relations that are compatible with these. And the first sort of non classical, non, I don't want to say non trivial, because this is non trivial, but the, the first one that you know, wasn't well known 50 years ago is um, the following. You say this is going to you know, call this a k equals six example. This is k equals four, k being the number of. Points of the boundary of the disk or the relation. And say that this picture plus this picture plus this picture minus delta times this picture plus that picture plus that equal to zero. And we want, to, in order for this to work out, we want delta squared to be equal to. Okay, so how, how would one ever think of something? Well, you could have um, come up with this by just by solving the relations. Let's, let's call this a u. We, what we want is that u has six things on the outside, and that that's equal to zero for any all six placements of this little term. Um, and similarly, we can solve these equations for any k, any even number. Yeah, there are some examples which are closely related to like bottom S and two. We'll see later. Um, okay, so what I didn't get around to saying yesterday um, it's actually a couple of exercises, and the exercises are meant to motivate the machinery. And we can you've got a very simple definition of vector spaces you know, based on this local relation. Surfaces, but you know, how would you calculate the dimension? I just claimed this finite dimension of any surface. Um, and that's not so hard to prove if you get the exact dimension and things like that is maybe a little trickier. Um, so this, yeah, so that's one of the things that makes us sort of introduce more category theory and form out this into the subject. So if you enjoy playing with examples like this, the things you might want to look, is, look at is the dimension of the scan level of the torus. And this is the, we call it, the delta squared equals 2 example. Um, so one thing that's pretty easy to show is that it's less than or equal to 15. A little more work to show it's less than or equal to 10. Harder still shows less than equal to nine, and harder thing to show is that it's exactly equal to nine. Um, so again, these first things can be done using very elementary methods, and to prove that is, as I know, you have to be slightly more sophisticated. So what does delta squared equals two mean? Um, what it means is I've, this notation A up here. Um, it's, it's kind of a generic notation that I use for lots of different field functors f and local relations. And so here I'm talking about a particular a for a particular example, not any a for, you know, five minutes from now a is going to mean some specific. Yeah, you know, this, this example up here. Yeah, this, I'm calling this the guilty. This, it's just a temporary name for this example. Um, another exercise is um, solve the uh, k equals h equations. I um, if we have eight points on the boundary of the disk and there's fourteen possible diagrams we can draw at a number, there's some you know, unique up to scale linear combination of those fourteen diagrams. 
So it doesn't matter how you calculate it, you get zero, and that leads to um, another example of this. Um, and I can get this is a tedious exercise, but it's doable by hand. One more ago, and I did it. But we would like kind of a general method for finding all the solutions. That's something we might get later. And then the final um, exercise, you know, to get really enthusiastic, is to, um, there, there's a shaded version of this. So I think those five diagrams will become. Shaded version. And the shaded version is very popular, especially at Berkeley, because um, Juan Jones and his students are always doing that case. And you should think of the, the two colors. And let me draw an example of a shaded temporal view diagram. I just color the regions black and white, and then I'll alternate them in red. Take all those diagrams with more black and white shading. It's the system on the boundary. That leads to a slightly different theory. And then um, So you, you do all possible shadings so um, for the vertical six of the ten diagrams? No, no, the shadings have to agree on the boundary. So whenever we have uh -huh. diagrams together, it, this is going to be true throughout the course, we, we always want the boundary to be, you know, we just if someone tries to write a formal song of a, two diagrams and the boundaries don't agree. Get very confused because that just doesn't make sense. So that makes question. So how it turns. Okay, so in the we can again look at um, this game module of the torus and call this in the shaded that's the square of this two theory. And that's got Two elements. We've got um, the black empty diagram. I do just color the whole torus black and don't put any curves. And also sitting inside it is the white. And so the, the question is um, is, is black and those two things. I think it's a question, even though these, these things have an elementary definition, I don't think it's easy to use any elementary techniques to answer that. But once we develop all the categorical machinery, it will be easy to answer. Okay, so enough of the Tinder video. Um, so now I'm going to talk about one more family of examples, and then you can say what these are examples of. Again, we're trying to put the concrete examples before the definitions that they made. Um, so let um, T be some topological space. We have T for target space. And uh, exam one example we're particularly interested in is when um, the classifying space of a finite group. And now we can define another functor f. f of, um, and this, this works for any n. So n is anything, but n is fixed. Um, f of an n manifold, actually that makes a manifold of any other dimension manifolds too. Find a set of all continuous maps um, from the line T. Now we want to make this definition again, but what we need is a local relation. And so we'll say that um, if, um, 
um, f and g are in this space. Now, for the local relation, so I, I, this, this, um, this first line applies to manifolds of any dimension up to m, but for the local relation, we're only interested in this dimension m, not the lower ones. Um, so if f and g are two maps from our manifold m into the target space, we'll, we'll say that um, f is equivalent to g if um, f is homotopic. And a lemma, I said before this, the relation needs to be local, so we can find it just looking at the dimensional balls, not looking at the whole manifold at once. And so uh, a lemma is um, f, f is homotopic to G if and only is local. So this, um, once we have these, we can define a vector space, for, you know, which will depend on our target space T. And the point is that the, then we can ask if we cut the manifolds M into pieces, what's the doing there? I mean, it's just the same as what we discussed yesterday, which probably I should write down again. Um, so, Same green as before. So to find the blue theorem, I have to um, first introduce a, a category for n minus one manifolds. So we'll define A of n minus one manifold be one category whose objects are fields on. Y, morphisms from A to B are in this vector space defined on the Y plus I, which is now an manifold. The boundary condition is given by A and B. And the composition is going. Yes. Same definition made before and occurs on surfaces of examples. It still makes sense here. And now, given a situation so we have M and then we pull it up into That right hand A means F modulo homotopy? Yeah, so finite fine linear combinations of things that F modulo homotopy. Mm -hmm. So it's um, so the same addition as before, but it's changing, changing the F. But notice that these objects we don't divide up by homotopy. So you know, the objects in this category are, are actual maps into T, say classified space and not. And that's very important. It's, it's easy to get tripped up, especially if you have an experience of low dimensional topology where you always do things in a isotopy. Here, you don't want to. Okay, so we're still trying to state the ruling theorem as a reminder. It was last time. Um, I defined a category for one manifold, and now if I'm ruling along. So doing two copies of Y together. Here, um, we have A of Y plus A of uh, opposite X on A of M, by which I mean a collection of vector spaces A of M with arbitrary 
boundary conditions. Um, and uh, the theorem that we talked about a lot last time is that A of the B manifold is the co end of this action. So, another way to say it, if we consider the special case where we're just gluing two manifolds together along Y. Um, this is saying that you know, so the special case is that A of M1 along Y and M2 is naturally isomorphic to the tensor product of A of M1 and M2. So A of M1 gives a left representation of A of Y and M2. Um, so we haven't, we haven't proved this theorem yet, we'll prove it eventually, but the point is the proof is sort of exactly the same as in the Cosmos Services example. So we realize even at first glance, you know, maps in the spaces look different than curves or maybe graphs embedded in surfaces formally, they behave very much the same. Um, so another remark I wanted to make about these examples is in the case where the target space is the the classifying space of a finite group, we can think of these as um, isomorphism classes of G bundles over M. And then you could also think about the case where, you know, suppose G is a, a general B group, not just a zero dimensional B group. Um, and in fact, that's why this diagraph in Witten introduced this family of examples that they wanted to do. They wanted to extend some techniques from, say, you know, connected, simply connected B groups to the other. Arbitrary, not necessarily connected case, and this is just kind of a toy example. For me. Okay, um, so yeah, so I think now we're ready to talk about um, what all of this you know, local relations nonsense has to do with quantum field theory. And so I should warn you, once or twice I've attempted to make the following argument in you know, similar talks, and usually it's just like blank stairs. You know, it didn't, you know, I was worried it was going to be boring and things people already know, but you know, it's either I presented badly or it's more complicated than I think. But I'm, I'm going to try again. But um, be sure to interrupt me if it's, um, anything's not clear. Because, again, I think this is one of the core ideas, and it's also an idea that's not. Well, what I, I think the first 10 or 15 minutes of what I say is, is um, very well known, but then you know, the last 5 or 10 minutes is um, less well known. And I think that last 5 or 10 minutes is kind of you know, the core idea. So I'm hoping I can succeed in getting it across. Okay. Um, so, um, what is. Quantum field theory. Um, well, one thing one does, I'm, I'm not going to try to say what quantum field theory is in general, but it's sort of fundamental thing one does in quantum field theory is a path integral. So, what's the path integral? Well, we have some um, n plus 1 dimensional manifold W. So, these, these manifolds will be one higher dimension than the ones we've been talking about here. And we define it to be the integral over all fields on W of some function of that field. And so, this gives some complex number. Okay, so what? Um, so, again, F. W or doesn't W. Actually, you know, I think I want to I want to add a boundary condition. So, so C lies in fields on boundary W. Let's add a boundary condition.
this is a remark about boundary definition. When you're doing real physics, you know, not topological quantum field theory, you find that integrals that make sense for closed manifolds, when you try to do them on manifolds of boundary, you know, they just diverge or they're not well behaved unless you put some kind of boundary. You know, sort of constraint into the boundary. And so formally, this is playing with the same way. What we're, what we're doing here is much simpler. Um, I should also say that what I'm saying for the next 20 or 25 minutes is um, I'm not going to be completely rigorous. It's, I'm especially not going to be rigorous when it comes to like analytical details about whether those spaces are complete or that kind of thing. It's just sort of meant for motivation. We'll start being rigorous after we're done with it. So this is more for motivation. Um, so, so if anyone's been listening, you, sh you shouldn't sweat small technical details. You should just see whether the, the big picture is making sense. And if it isn't, just keep up. Um, okay, so I've got to finish defining these things. Um, so, F of W, gravity condition C is fields on W, um, which restrict C on the boundary of W. Um, and T is some function from um, this field is to the circle root. And we think the circle group is living inside the complex numbers, so you add up and the same Um So what we're going to do is this is um is just look at locality and see how far it gets us, and eventually we'll see at least to that. Um, I guess one one last remark I want to say is it's to actually make in, in in real examples, which I'm not going to be talking about, it's notoriously difficult to make these integrals well defined. So you know, I, I assume most of you already know this, but you know physicists manipulate these things as if they made sense and they come out with the right answers that. We've got a very good track record for getting things right, but they're actually like the you know, improvement. You know, this would be some big dimensional space and probably some infinite dimensional symmetries in the mind out body. It's just a mess. So we, we're going to put one. Typically in TP, TPFTs, you make a bypass around these difficulties, and we're going to try to make a very, you know, as, as short a bypass as we can, preserving as much as we can of the, of the story. So these fields, um, this field functor is local in the following sense, um, given Here they're going to restrict to B. And this I'm going to also be talking about X right here. So this is just notation for the version I'm about to write down. Um, the boundary condition. So, it's, so the situation is we want to compute something here. Um, we, we first might want to think of the uh, 
fields on the bleed manifold, which restrict to the new boundary conditions on the boundary. And then we can restrict um, get a map to fields on the cut manifold, cut boundary conditions, and, and sort of a free boundary here where we this new stuff we have to specify. And then from here, we can um, we have two different restriction maps to, you know, to either this edge or the other. So I'll call those maps R1 and R2. And those both restrict the fields on Y with boundary conditions D. D is this stuff right here. And the point is that this is a you know, equal up. The fields here, the, they're, they're precisely the ones, fields on the cut thing, which are really so I'm saying something very common to equalize it. And then also fields on W1 destruct union W2 should be equal to the product. So that's the locality of the fields function. Um, what about this function t? And I guess I should say that in the more usual notation is you know, t of f is equal to e to the i, some other function, real value function s of f, where this is you know, the action. But, but what we're doing is kind of irrelevant. Um, And x2 are fields on w1 and w2 earlier. Um, that's equal to the product. Okay, and then it follows from these that if we want to compute the path integral on the glued up manifold, we can you know, chop it into pieces and glue on, on the pieces. So one manifestation of this is. Um, Definite of the new manifold is equal to the integral over x, which are fields on the, the in my manifold that we're doing wrong. Now we integrate the line. Fields on the cut manifold with boundary conditions given by the open boundary points in two kinds of x. So again, C, X, and X are just the things here. So this is something like you know, integrating along the fibers. Again, I'm not. I'm not proving this is true, I'm just saying that you know, using the examples we want to expect that this is true. Okay, so then the next thing that I'll do, and we're and also I should say we're still in the very standard part of the of the story. Um, I want to introduce a vector space V for an N manifold. And this is defined to be Functions um, from fields on the manifold to the complex numbers. So there's some function space. And what, what kind of function? L2 function is continuous. Um, I'm not going to worry about that sort of detail. And now we can think of um, Z path integral. Again, one manifold 
is lying in this function space of this gallery. Of course, we get, you know, this is just rephrasing what we did before, given z of w evaluated on some field in family C, that's just this path integral with family C. So it is changing point of view there. Um, we also need to think about the locality of D of M. I have this, how does this vector space behave when we start cutting in the pieces? Um, so, The way that this vector space really is supposed to be the thing will eventually be the of a. No, no, it's, it's much, it's much larger. So it's okay. going to have a subspace, which is going to be dual to that. Okay. So, but yeah, okay. that's what we're driving. We're going to just to give a roadmap of what's happening in the next few minutes. We're going to, this is typically a big interdimensional vector space. But sitting inside there is, is something interesting. Interested in, and we'll see that the thing sitting inside there is naturally dual to something that's defined that way. So A is meant to be the other end of the alphabet, Z. So the Z notation is going to be super. Um, okay, so I'm gluing these N manifolds together along um, um, what it's called. Uh, and we're going to have a key. It's one dimensional. Um, and so the need of the root up manifold is naturally isomorphic to the right direct sum quotes because the thing is something wrong because it's a space. Um, yields on. Of um, the space of the code and manifold conditions. So, uh, you yeah, know, so I've got functions in all, all fields of the group thing, and I'm just saying that if we just look at the, you know, we can think of all fields as being a bundle over the restrictions to this new surface P here. Okay, so now, um, now we have this, we can think of the path integral in a third way. We started out thinking there's just some function where we specify a boundary condition. And then we said, well, we can leave the boundary condition blank, and then it becomes a function of boundary conditions. But now we want to think of it as sort of an operator going between two different parts of this boundary. And how does Z and W and Z of Oh, um, um, we're like, so what, what is V of boundary? V of boundary is just functions from field zone boundary to the complex numbers. So to give you a function, to give you an element of V of boundary, what I have to do is anytime you tell me something here, I need to give you a so that's complex a boundary number. Condition. Yeah, so then I just take, so here I am evaluating this function. On the boundary condition, I just and then I just plug it in as a boundary condition and, and do that. Yeah. Under the, the boundary condition is supposed to be something in V of the of partial W. Is that what it's no, the, the boundary condition V of um. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? It's it's, it's more complicated. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, some, some of these things I, I get to pick just because this, this is well known and I'm here to get to the less well known stuff. But if you haven't seen this before, it, it is certainly confusing. It takes some good news to it. So, maybe slow me down if necessary. Um, so, sorry, so B of MY is the. Is 
where you see sort of space of functions on fields with value one. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So let me let me uh, here I can add a boundary condition and I just look at fields. I think all, in the, in the, it gets kind of tedious writing these boundary conditions over the time, so at some point I'm going to leave them out of the notation before I'm saying they are important. So I'm going to try to be, even though I'm being completely sloppy with analytic details, the nobles conversion, which function space I'm talking about, I'm going to try to be fussy and precise about these boundary conditions. Um, Now, so there's my n plus one initial manifold. Um, I've divided the boundary into two pieces, I'll call it. Boundary n and w, and out and w. And I'm going to say d is equal to the boundary. So I want to find my can now think of the path interval as being a function from vector space associated to the incoming boundary. To vector space associated to the outcome. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that makes sense. Yeah, boundary condition. Um, for all the, the functions, and I think the path interval perhaps maybe sub D here. Um, so, so I'm about to say that in more detail. So Z of W. Sub D evaluated on R evaluated on X. So what does this mean? Um, F is something here. In other words, F is a function from some fields associated to the incoming value to the complex numbers. And then X is a field on the algorithm. So if we want to land here, we need to be able to kind of give them such a nice fit up number. Um, and that's going to be the integral. Um, the fields on W, which um, is this, which is to X of this function. Evaluated on um, mm -hmm. so, uh, Y is to the boundary W times T It, it seems complicated, but it's sort of the only reasonable thing you can do. So let, again, let's review it. The, the, um, and in some sense, you can think of this path interval as when we divide the boundary two pieces as a matrix, and given a boundary condition here and a boundary condition here, it's out. And we can 
So I'm, I'm making an analogy with things like fire and bi-dimensional vector spaces. Um, path intervals is like a matrix because if you specify something here, specify something here, you can into it. This incoming thing is just functions on the things here, and so now we're just Is that if, if the space of fields was a discrete space, then that would just be kind of your product given by that space of fields as the basis. Right. Yeah, but, but I, I, you're absolutely right. Some of the details I'm suppressing um, is, is being able to go back and forth between V and space of space. Okay, so. Awesome. So what do we have so far? It's just saying that we can think of the path angle as, a, as an operator from this function space for the incoming boundary conditions to a function space for the outgoing boundary conditions. That's this thing right there. And that, that's a very standard idea. You know, if you look at the very earliest, you know, some paper by ITO where he coined the term in TQFT, you know, he, he talks about this. But I've said nothing new so far. Um, and also, so far, I haven't used the fact that this is topological. I mean, everything I'm saying so far would be fine if, you know, man folks had metrics and they were doing, you know, I'd be giving you some very vague introduction to quantum field theory. Pretty soon we'll be using the assumption that it only depends on the topological type of things. Um, okay, so we get, a, we get an operator, and so I'm thinking of W as some, some kind of boardism with corners between two different parts of this boundary. In particular, um, we consider an n manifold cross i. And um, y has been, and so I'm going to. You might think of y cross i looks like this, but you don't want that. You want this. In other words, we um, I'm, I'm defining this to be. I'm going to identify you know, t comma t with t comma t prime or t. Pinched. Pinched. So what we want to have is that the boundary of y cross i is equal to so two copies of y. We want that to even be true if y has been. So once we Make these definitions, we can consider z of y cross i, and it's going to be an, an operator from the vector space associated to y. And maybe there's a boundary condition d. To itself. So we have these operators. But you know, so the fundamental fact about y cross i is that if we do two of them together, that's I said more than just one of them. So y cross i neon y. This isomorphic means you know, the equivalent you know, not as manifolds of metrics, but just as manifolds with t squares in there, assuming that the letter is structured or not, or not in structure. And then if we assume that this path interval we wrote down has is topologically invariant, which is a very unusual thing to assume 
from a physics point of view, and if you look at Witten's early papers on this subject, he's saying over and over again, look, look how weird this is, and just as a, a warning to his physicist friends that he's doing something kind of strange. But if we make that assumption, again, it follows um, that z of y cross y composed with z of y cross y is equal to z of y cross y. And I should probably put a subscript d on all of these. And then there's something I forgot to say over here. Let me say it again that once we define these operators, they compose. So if I have w1 and w2 out of this situation, and you're thinking of that z w1 and w2 is equal to z of w1 and w2. And this is just a restatement of um, this here. <laughs> so this has to do with kind of doing a manifold to itself. But if we can if we take this, this change of view and do two manifolds together for this composition property, and again, this is one of the very, very standard factor TFTs. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now a special case of that is we do two of these color board things together, and this is true enough. So in other words, this is going to be some kind of projection. And now, we find the Hilbert space for the theory, z of y is defined in the um, maybe with boundary condition d, is defined to be the image of the cat and the other of y cross y. So often that will be a finite dimensional space within the this paper. Within a dimensional space. And again, we resorted to our overloaded notation. You know, Z applied to the n plus 1 manifold is a path integral, which is you know, some functional boundary conditions or an operator between functions on boundary conditions. If we take it, um, if we apply it to an n-manifold, it's some subspace of living inside this big vector space of functions on boundary conditions. Okay. So, I guess one more observation is that for any, for all in this one apples W, um, we can blue collars on. So this is W and the blue onto it, W plus I. That's isomorphic to just W again. Not W plus I down to W plus I. W union on down to W plus I. Um, isomorphic to W. And so this implies, by some argument before, is that Z of W thought of as a, you know, this lives in the vector space. The big vector space associated with that W, and in fact, it lies inside the smaller vector space. So, before when we wrote um, yeah, up here, you know, so it's sort of obvious that the path integral. These functions on boundary conditions, but only a very small special subspace of these functions on boundary conditions will be um, ones we're interested in. And this is roughly the, the difference. Remember, when we were defining scheme models, we had all the finite linear combinations of pictures, and then we had this finite dimensional quotient. And this is the sort of dual to that statement. And that's, that's what we're driving for. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so Z of boundary W is the image of this 
if I just think of boundary W cross I, that gives some operator. That operator is going to be defined over here. Here we define it in like relative borders into corners. In this case, there are, there are no corners. And then by this argument over here, that is some kind of item of the projection. And so we have the image of that projection. And because gluing a collar onto a manifold doesn't change its topological type, it means that the path integral is there. So is one of the effects of this deconstruction? I don't know the examples of if this happens, but I can imagine somehow that this would solve some of the analytic problems where it's going to say, well, I'm going to work with all functions, and then I find out that kind of moving on these polys kind of modifies the types of functions that I have to think about. Is that ever happening? Yeah, I, I think it does. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on that subject, but I, I think if you look in the literature, say for term science theory, you know, because we know that we're I, you know, often the very first thing they do is try to get to cells, if not to this finite dimensional cell space, to something that's closer to it. So, um, okay, so at this point, I, I think I said that we, you know, we cover all the standard story. And I, it's been a long time since I've read it. And maybe I never read it. But there was an early influential article in TIA trying to, trying to explain what Witten was doing, what Witten for mathematicians. It was a short paper, and basically he said, as I recall, you know, pretty much what things I've just said now. Um, but the point I'm trying to make now is that we, we shouldn't stop there, that we should, you know, so what we've, maybe another way of saying it is if I've got some big n plus one manifold w, I can cut it into slices, or maybe each slice, not much as interesting as happened, and I can compute the full path integral by composing each of these things like that. But we should cut it up even further. We can also sort of cut an individual thing, and that will um, make things better. So in other words, we want to exploit this locality of these vector spaces D and see how it translates to these subspaces Z. So the first step is um, this argument I made right here that the, um, let me start a different way. So, so here's an n-manifold. You might want to think of it as the boundary of an inverse one manifold. And I want to consider some subspace, say capital D, be a ball or a disk. And I want to glue on the top of the D cross I. Okay, so what, what can we say about this situation? Well, we have the big vector space associated to M. And then from what I set up here, um, I can write that as direct sum in quotes over all boundary. So I, and then I want to write M as some maybe for that. As a ball of union is complement. And it's union along some sphere. So we can write this as a direct sum over all boundary conditions on that sphere of the vector space for the ball boundary conditions instead of the vector space for the complement. Conditions. So something I forgot to say earlier when talking about locality for B is that um, the uh, N1 disjoint union in 2 is um, B and N1 
So I'm just, maybe I should, I should redraw this picture. So here's M. I'm sitting aside it. I have D. I just, I'm just saying the functions, you know, the function space can be broken down according to how it restricts to the circle S to functions on the disjoint union of, of M and D. And then, okay, but now I have, instead of this, I can have an, an operator. I'm going to call it I sub D. In fact, I should maybe call um, this thing I sub Y. Projection associated to manifold Y. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Here we're showing us projection, so we're going to call it I sub I can take pi sub d, capital D, comma little d, and so with the identity for x sum over all d of these, with a map into um, that can be uh, capital D is capital D here? Yes, it's capital D. Thank you. Okay, so let's go right again. This, this is going to be important. So this is just sort of a relative version of what we're doing. You know, eventually we're going to want to do this on the, on the boundary of the manifold. And so what we saw before is because we can glue a collar onto a manifold and that doesn't affect the topological type, it follows that the path you go for the manifold lies inside the energy of the projection associated with that. But now, um, it follows similarly that if there's W and sitting inside you have B contained in boundary W, I can move on a little bit of color there. So we're going to partially probably doesn't affect the boundary. Um, I want to eventually want to do that, but I, I think I want to say to Here's a better one. Consider it M cross I. Take the union along B of B plus I and pinch down the conditions. This is isomorphic just to N plus I again. And it's a new manifold. And so it follows that if we do all of these things I've drawn here, all n plus one manifolds, so I can take path intervals and try to close. And it means that the path interval of m cos i, which is this projection we're we'll calling pi sub m, composed with, I guess I need a name, we'll call this pi sub b. It's direct sum of the all boundary conditions there. Composed with pi sub b. Is this equal to um, is this equal to pi sub n? This is the so this is very similar to the one we wrote down before, except now we just have a partial. Okay, something that follows from that. So those are both projections. 
So that, that implies that an image of pi sub y is contained inside the image of pi sub b. This is true for all b. And this, of course, is just equal to z of y. So this in turn implies that z of y is contained in the intersection over all possible disks, all possible balls in one of um, the image of this projection associated to the ball. Oh, yes, sir. Oops. And so that is What is pi b and pi b? Okay. Pi b d. Yeah, I guess I'm using y over here. Okay, so m, m and y are kind of the same thing. I guess I, for some reason, yeah, so if you ever see a y and an m, you should probably assume they're, yeah. they're the same thing, the same sort of thing. Um, and then, so pi, pi sub m is the same as pi sub y which is um, this projection associated with y cross, basically the path interval of y cross i, but that path interval can be thought of as an operator, and that operator is a projection, and that projection has an image, and the image of that projection is plays a very really important role in the theory. Um, pi sub d is a sort of a relative version of that. We, if we fix a boundary condition on d, then we can write this pi sub d for that boundary condition, tensor with the identity outside on, on the complement of D. And then we can direct some of our boundary conditions and again we get some kind of map which turns out to be a projection, projection from D of so then T and C. And then we have this equation because Boolean on a ball doesn't, has no effect in this manifold D, this manifold D, this manifold D, there's a corresponding equation for operators. And then we're writing this function composition is just the way of doing this sort of integration of the fibers that we're doing here for the locality of the path interval. And these things, but then just by simple algebra, you've got a couple of projections and they compose like this. It means that the image of this projection lies inside the image of that projection. The image of this projection is the Hilbert space that we're interested in. And so we come to the conclusion that this thing is in the intersection of all these things here. And the point is that these are local. This depends only on this ball B. So we're, we're trying to exploit the local locality. Just, again, if you look at that early article that Tia's and many that followed it, they decided, you know, they, like me, need to avoid actually trying to do an interval like this. And they said, well, a TPFT is just some kind of functor that assigns a vector space to n manifolds and an operator to Plus one manifolds and they compose. Um, and that was a very influential definition, but it it's kind of it's um, it underspecifies things because these aren't these vector spaces associated with manifolds, they're not arbitrary. They in turn have to have a sort of locality. And um, you know, to improve on this, what we actually want to show is that these two things are equal. So how do we show that? Um, Actually, um, the use of n is equal to the intersection of the B um, So let's take an open cover of them. I need, I need to say cover because I actually want the balls to be closed. Take the, co the cover, I close the balls, just the interiors from the open cover um, of M and B. So this is unit of E sub I. So here's M and we have E sub 1, E sub 2, and so on. 
And what I can do, let me draw M again one dimension down, and say this is um, P sub 1, and so I can glue on P sub 1 cross I. And maybe P sub 2 is over here, and here's P sub 2 cross I. this and I can move on so three across I and I just continue on it's sort of you know you can think of as you know throwing down some lump of clay over each set in our open cover. And when we do, we're done we find that if we take the union in the proper way of all I of B sub I cross I that's equal to M plus M. Just built up the product of little pieces of each of the ball. And what we've been doing over and over again for the last 20 minutes or so is whenever we see some equation of manifolds like y cross i union y cross i is isomorphic to y cross i, you get a corresponding equation for path in between the topology and the algebra. And so here, so this implies that. Z of y plus i, this is projection associated with y, is equal to i sub b1 over i sub b2 over here. And this one over all the finite even balls in our open code. Okay, and so and then this in turn implies that we have a quality here. Yes, I have two questions. One of them is, is should it be really obvious to me that these different projectors are of each other? Um, maybe not completely obvious, but that, that's a good question. Um, why do they commute with each other? Um, so we have a picture right here. I'm sorry. Let's <laughs> try. Let me not move back and forth so much. Um, yeah, so that they do commute. Um, that's because. Schematically, it's like this. So this is v1 cross i, v2 cross i. This is homeomorphic to v2 plus i. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, and, and I guess both these in turn are isomorphic to just v1 union v2. I'm probably assuming some of you know, these things don't intersect in some part of the world. There's no intersections. So I just claim that as manifolds, um, my second question is sort of in the in compact space, it's going to you know, I know I can pick it up and cover and just assume it's finite, or I can do exactly what you said. Do you have all sort of the threat machinery for doing this in the non compact case too? Um, I've not thought about the non compact case. So, so I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Anything to say? It's an interesting question. Yeah, but I, 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 mean, I think I said in the first lecture that it, you know, my manifolds will always be compact unless I say otherwise, but it remains in effect here. Okay, so, so what we've done, our big conclusion is that um, we 
you can always assume that our Hilbert spaces have this form, they're the intersection of these locally defined projections. So the final step we want to do is now look at dual spaces and see that we wind up with the skin module definition that we started out. Um, check the time. Okay. Two minutes. <laughs> um, okay, so I didn't realize it was so late. Um, I, mean, I think I'll just do that next time. But just, just because it's just worth, because it's an important point, I'm, I'm saying it twice. Um, I just to give a, a little foreshadowing of what comes next. We'll take this important equation and we'll um, and deduce from it that the dual space to this, these functions, you know, I guess you know, the, the big space, V of Y, you know, all, say we're taking all functions on fields, so the dual space is going to be finite from the linear combinations of fields. And then when we look at a subspace, that's going to correspond to a quotient of the dual big space, and that quotient could be some kind of local relation to find one of So that means that the examples we were talking about in the beginning, where we're using these elementary techniques, are actually should fit in very nicely with these physics ideas. So that's what we're going to start next time. And then also everything I've been doing today is kind of a little hand waving because I have not been worrying about any details. Get some quotes and the some quotes. Um, but starting next time, we'll try to write down some precise axioms for these fields and try, try to derive everything from that.